think that the sheriff has heard of you? Yeah, he has. I, I tried to sucker punch him. Um, I sent him a signed copy of my book. <laughs> and, well, if you read, if you get a little bit into the book, and the authors know, it's got him classified as the angel of death, ruling over this extremely dangerous environment. And I talk about the people of the guards that murdered him there. But, so, two pages before that, two pages before that, I wrote, Thanks to you, Sheriff Joe Arpaio, I'm off the drugs and I'm speaking to young people all over the UK. My story's influencing them and you know, it's, something really positive has come out of it. I figured if he would read that and tell the media, and it would increase media coverage of my story. Everyone I told I was doing that refused to believe me. They were like, there's no way he would even acknowledge you because he's completely famous and I'm a nobody. So if he acknowledges anything, the media jump on it. He must have thought it was Christmas. He must have woke up, read that, he scanned the page, didn't read any further obviously, put it on his Twitter account and said, I'm on a plane to so-and-so reading Sean Atwood's Hard Time. As soon as he did that, I got CNN, CBS, Fox, all contacting me for interviews because he's so famous and he acknowledged that. He's not said a word since. Yeah, he's probably realised it's by now it was a sucker punch. What is the healthcare like? For starters, the healthcare staff in the prison system are usually barred from public practice. So it's the bottom of the barrel. Now, not all of them. Um, there was a, a really good shrink that I ended up in the hands of who really helped me, whose quotes I lean on still to today. To get seen, you have to beg a guard when he's doing a security walk for a form called a medical tank order. He has to sign it. If he's in a good mood, he'll take it off you, and it has to go through various departments. Now, depending upon the nature of your complaint, and the medical staff assume all inmates are fakers, you will get seen, it could be months, it could be never, it could be right away, it could be days. Um, it's very hard to get seen. A cellmate, when I was moved to maximum security, said, taught me that they like lottery tickets, basically. And he was putting them in every single day, and he taught me how to play the system to get seen. Like I said earlier, people with the spider bites, we had to squeeze that puss out ourselves. It was very hard. Um, a, a mother, a woman was in there who was diabetic, she'd just been arrested. The daughter was calling the jail all morning, saying, my mum needs to get seen by medical. She doesn't take a medication, she's going to die. They completely ignored her and let her mum die. And she, her mum got millions. Man at the back. Uh, you're saying that there's a hierarchy of like, the inmates. Like, was there like, one big problem? Each race, all right, each race has its own gang. So the Aryan Brotherhood is the whites, the Mau Mau's is the blacks, the Mexican Mafia is the Mexican nationals, and the, and the uh, new Mexican ma Mafia is the, is the Chicanos or the Mexican Americans. So there's four major groups. Now, all the leaders of those gangs in, within Arizona, the proper gang leaders who call the shots, are locked down in the super maximum prison in Florence. They're called STG, Security Threat Group Status. They never get out, but they pass their instructions through the prison system through um, letters called kites that are passed from inmate workers to inmate workers. So it goes down like that. The Orion Brotherhood started out in California and spread all across America. If you now account for all the murders in America, Classify them by who's doing them. Erin Brotherhood is presently the number one for committing murders. They're considered so dangerous now um, and violent and ruthless that the Italian Mafia goes to them to hire their contract killers when these guys get left out. They've taken over the drug business on the streets as well. They send women to seduce guards, find out where the guards live and blackmail the guards into bringing drugs and tattoo stuff into them. It's big, big business. Now, in the Lower security <coughs> levels, the orders come down from the top guys, but they'll be like a head of the race in each pod. So they'll be like a head of the whites, head of the blacks, head of the Chicanos, head of the Mexicans. So it works like that. It's all very structured. Try it again. Yeah? Have you ever met anyone who was lucky? Like, he never got raped and definitely didn't leave this fight lighting. So he had no trouble. When you're going into a fight, you've got no big trouble. 
Do they ever meet anyone who never got any trouble in jail, like fights or rapes, or that the head of the white light? Yes. Yes. No, there's so much conflict in there, and argument, and stress, and tension. You've got to have eyes in the back of your head. You could be sat around playing cards one minute, and next minute there's like a full-scale riot goes off. You just never know what's going to happen next. Everything you take for granted prior to getting arrested, all the things you think about in the day, who's called you, who you're going to text, blah, blah, blah. That's all gone. It's just raw survival when you first go in. You're just thinking, how am I going to get through this day? Your first couple of days, you're in such shock. You're trying to sleep at night, and you can feel your heart beating against the surface. There's no way to get to sleep. So it's just, it's not an environment where you can ever relax. Your adrenaline's constantly going. If everybody's like constantly trying to kill the sheriff and stuff, do they expect all this bad stuff to stop once he's dead and there's someone else with enough power to just take over and it would just come in? Um, I think that if someone took over, they would make the conditions better than they are presently. And that would be an improvement. The people who've tried to kill him, who he's claimed have tried to kill him and have not succeeded, um, I've just got him more prestige in the eyes of the public and enabled him to buy like armoured vehicles that he goes to work in now and have more and more bodyguards and spend more and more money on this stuff. So, you know, my hope is that my, what I've written, my book gets published in America in May, my hope is that it, it will cause outrage amongst the American public because people have no idea what's really going on there and that conditions will get changed. That, and that's what motivated my writing in the first place. Go on and be normal. I don't think I'm ever going to be normal. Um, yeah, I definitely do want to keep going on influencing young people. It's really enjoyable and really lucky. And, um, you know, I don't see that changing for the foreseeable future. So, yeah, I'd like to continue. Um, that makes one's my assumption. I imagine you know, you're totally re socialised into prison life while you were there. Yeah. Is that now have a knock on effect on how you? live your everyday life now. Absolutely. Ridiculously early in bed early I'll touch on two points there. They say once you've done five years you get institutionalised. One of the first things I did when I was on that regular flight home from LA to London, all the people were getting on, could smell the women's perfume in front of everybody. I put my hand up and asked a female member of the cabin crew permission for me to go on the toilet. I was so used to being told what I could and couldn't do. She just laughed at me and said, you don't need to ask. So my mum said I was like a puppy dog, following her around in the house and waiting for instruction. So it took a while for me to readjust. But it's benefited me in numerous ways. Um, I don't see anything at all for granted now. I see people complaining about little things. Stuck in a traffic jam, you know, getting all stressed out. And I'm thinking, if they'd been in a life and death situation, that wouldn't even register. I wake up every day with a smile on my face because I'm a free man and living in the West where conditions are so good. And we really have it made here, yeah, you know, two thirds of the world living off a dollar a day and people don't, a lot of people don't understand or, or appreciate how good we have it here. Um, so the other thing is, I was told I would be able to read people's body language when I got out, see through people, and it's true. When you're constantly in fear of something violent happening, you learn to read everything that's going on around you very quickly because it's just to, to, in order to survive. So when I meet people now, I can tell who's genuine and who isn't very easily. And I can read people's body language very easily as well because of that. So and the, the shrink, he said, you're going to have a skill set from being here that is going to help you for the rest of your life when it comes to dealing with people in awkward situations. And I do. It's given me a lot more confidence um, in, in general. So, and I used to be shy, you know, the first time I did a talk to a school, I was so nervous, uh, I couldn't even eat my breakfast, and I paced in front, at the front like I was in a prison cell, I couldn't even look at the audience, I think it was like year 10, and I was, lived, come from living with murderers, and I couldn't, uh, the, the school kids were making me so nervous, but I got used to it, so. <laughs> yeah, teachers are the best public speakers, there you are. Okay, anyone got anything else? All right, well, thank you for all of your questions then. That's been great. Cheers.